My guest is Amit Avigur. He's a PhD student at Hebrew University. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Amit, why did you choose minority-majority relations to study? Well, I think it is a very um, politicized and very interesting issue. I mean, we are, it is around us all the time in Israel, and well, as I feel, and um, I just wanted to, you know, study it some more and understand some more about how Arabs and Jews can work, work along in, within Israel. Well, there's lots of minorities in Israel, depending on how you look at it, you know, there's Hasidic minorities, ultra-Orthodox, you know, Druzim, why the Palestinians? Well, I don't, I'm not sure I can give you an honest and direct answer, but I think that, um, well, it depends on where I grew up. I mean, later in, in my, um, my youth age, I grew up in the Galilee, where there are lots of Jews and Arabs, and they are very much mixed. And for me, the Arab presence was very, very apparent, and I never experienced that before. And so I came to think about it. I came to think about the problems that evolved. And I had this soldier in the army that uh, was killed in a bombing in, uh, in the Maroon Junction in, in the Galilee. And so, again, it kind of you know, turns things on. You, you start thinking about how we are to live together here. And in the Galilee, did you have any Arab friends? Because you live quite separate lives, Israelis we do and live, Arabs. We do live quite separate lives, and regretfully, no, I don't have. But I did visit frequently uh, Arab villages and cities, and, and m most of the time the, the, um, the, the contact was, was, you know, humane, as, as, as normal people do. And, and I many times regret to hear that people do fear, um, either Jews fear to... Uh, go into uh, Arab villages or the other way around. And I think it's re quite regretful. I mean, we're missing a lot of each other. Did you learn Arabic? I learned a bit Arabic as, as, uh, as a pupil in, in, in school, uh, but I didn't go on with it. What's your sense of the present situation with the Palestinian Arabs in Israel? Well, I have to say, I was just coming from a session uh, uh, in a conference, and, and uh, some very, much, very renowned scholars there uh, were saying that the uh, situation is, well, not good and deteriorating even. And I don't know if I can personally sense it this way, but I, they, they have some really good points about um, the tension within Israel. I mean, not even counting the Palestinians in the occupied territories, and the, the, the citizens within Israel, uh, that... Um, Tension is rising because of acts of both sides, and well, I just ha for now I have uh, I have to hope that it will not you know grow up more and, and escalate to violence because it has it has happened before, and uh, ten, about ten years ago. So I hope it won't, and and th that that the communities will will uh, start learning each other and start thinking about ways to to live together because we are bound to live together. We there is no other option. Why do you think there's not been far more programs that, you know, from the government to make sure that people get to know each other and that Arabic is made compulsory or something like that? Uh, why do you think that hasn't happened? Well, first of all, about the compulsory, the, the compulsory of, of learning Arabic, we do learn, I, I think every student, in, uh, every pupil in Israel learns Arabic in some way or the other, but it's very, very shallow Arabic, and it is literature Arabic. I mean, you cannot contact a person in the street with this Arabic. So it's, it's more or less like, okay, we, we're, we're, you know, there are Arabs around, we are giving you something about this, but we are not really interested that you will come to know. It's uh, like English Canadians learning French. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, maybe, I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with, with, your, with the reality, but, but maybe that is more or less the same. And, um, but I think that the, the, the main point is that Israel, um, Think of it, thinks of itself as the state for the Jewish people. I mean, this is the home of the Jewish people. And the Arab minority is, you know, uh, broadly speaking, we had, we, we as the Jewish minority, uh, had to accept their presence in, in the, within the borders of the state of Israel when it was established in 1948. Uh, and so we could not, other than give, than give, than um, award them citizenship. But on the other hand, um, the very essence of the state is a Jewish state. I mean, it's a democracy, but it's a, it's a Jewish state. So, practically speaking, it's, it thinks Jewishness. And the, uh, the uh, 
citizenship dimension, the, 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 the general dimension of, of, of citizens as citizens, regardless of the, if they are Arabs, Jews, or whatever else, um, is, is most of the time missing. What about the effects of, because one of the processes is, and you're, you're interested in this, in neoliberalism and the change in the economy, mm -hmm. and you get a state that's depending much more on civil society and entrepreneurship, etc. How has that affected the Palestinian population in Israel? Well, from, from, from what I've looked at, and it is especially about land issues, um, and that's exactly my, my, my thesis in, in, in the paper I'm going to present, is that regarding land, the exclusion patterns have, uh, maintain, have been maintained, during, at least during the 90s. They have maintained because of the state self-perception as a Jewish state. And so neoliberalism has been uh, very f um, apparent in other realms of life, such as uh, work, such as um, governance, um, cutting spending in, in welfare state and whatever. But in, in, in some areas, Israel has, you know, it, it was thought of, I think, I mean, that um, some areas will be kept aside because neoliberalism has this um, tendency to um, strip the state from what it perceives as important for the Jewish um, population within it. Because, what, I mean, I don't know, but my imagination takes me to the situation of a land ownership for one, which you're working on. And if you liberalize land and you make it all saleable and the Jews are, have the more powerful money economy, they can buy up more of the land. So there would be <coughs> a reaction against neoliberalism by, by Palestinians in that sense. On the other hand, there'd be many more opportunities for Palestinians to get into the economy, uh, you know, because they're being well-educated and well-trained and they're, they, the economy opens up for everybody, including the Palestinians. So there's opposite trends. True. It, it's very interesting that you, you mentioned the, the, the reaction after, after a possible neoliberalizing of, of land, and that is exactly the case in Latin America and in the two states I have checked, uh, I have studied. Uh, but, about, but it is very important to see that there is now a reform going on in Israel regarding land. And uh, so it, it seems like a reform that is supposed to liberalize land to privatize some plots of land, especially in the center of the state and center of the country. But um, it is done very in very certain terms that although they go through neoliberal principles, they still um, keep, the state still keeps some kind of um, track or some kind of control over um, the, the, the very allocation and planning and um, and what is done with, with this privatized land. And this track is, this, this keeping track is very much uh, Jewish oriented. I mean, there are certain, um, let's say, th there are some plots to be privatized in the center of Israel. Part of them are owned by the Jewish National Fund, which is, which is a, a Jewish um, fund. And instead of, uh, uh, when it uh, awards the state with, with some of the plots that it owned, it will receive plots in the Galilee and in the Negev, in the upper north and the south, which are predominantly um, settled by, by Arabs. By so it's already discriminatory in a way because they're, they're burgeoning, they have a high charge in birth rate, and they need uh, land for their expansion. And where is it coming from? It, it, well, to put it shortly, it doesn't come from anywhere. And that's what makes it very much a crisis. I mean, and then they start building houses or, or uh, enlarging houses because they need some more, some more room and then th it becomes somehow illegal because it, it is unauthorized by state authorities and then it has to be demolished sometimes. There are still unauthorized, un unrecognized villages, especially in the south of Bedouins, although they have been there uh, from, since before 1948. So the whole situation is very, and, and it's, and once at a time it, it, uh, it bursts out. I want to thank you, Amit, for coming on the show, being very informative and helpful, and good luck on your PhD thesis. Thank you very much for hosting me.